This is Love Notes, daily devotions from Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. Grace and peace to you. Our text today is the sixth chapter of Mark, verses 1 through 13, and Jesus is on the move again. Along with his disciples, he returns now to his hometown, it says. The Greek word here for hometown is place of his father. We're not really sure what father means in the Gospel of Mark. Unlike Matthew and Luke, there is no nativity, as you recall. We don't have the Holy Family in Bethlehem. We don't have stories about Joseph, his earthly father. Uh, We don't have any of that here. Jesus comes on the scene in Mark's Gospel, fully grown and being baptized by John. So he returns to this town, which is the town or the place of his father. And you can take that father in a couple of different ways. Whoever his earthly father might have been perceived to be and his father in heaven. On the Sabbath, it tells us that he went to the synagogue and he taught there. And many who heard him were astounded. Astounded is either a positive or negative term. Um, As the story continues, I think it's more negative. The people who hear him say, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that's been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? They're in kind of wonderment at that last statement. Look at all the deeds of power, but they want to know where this guy gets off. Where did he get all this stuff? This isn't the Jesus that they know who grew up as a little boy in this place. As a matter of fact, in verse 3, now a little spite comes out, it seems. Is not this the carpenter? By which they mean he's not a rabbi. I don't know why he's teaching up in front in the synagogue. He's not a healer. He's known to us as the carpenter. Probably something he learned while he was growing up. And then they say, is this not the son of Mary. The son of Mary is an insult. To call somebody in Jesus' time the son of their mother was to call them, if you'll pardon my crudity, a bastard. Jesus is the son of Mary. It's an epithet that's probably spit out. Is he not the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Not these, his sisters? They don't even get named here because, well, they're women. They took offense at him. I think that it sounds like perhaps they've taken offense at him since, well, forever. We don't know anything about Joseph in the Gospel of Mark. And it may have been very true that people perceived that Jesus was born out of wedlock. Uh, Joseph, or whoever the carpenter was in Mark's story, may in fact have been the father of all the other kids that are named here. But this one is the son of Mary. He's not a rabbi. He's just Jesus the bastard to us. That's what his hometown's reaction is. And we shouldn't try to candy coat it. The point here is that Jesus does not measure up. Mark doesn't have any problem proclaiming that Jesus doesn't measure up to the people and the eyes of this world. Jesus does not measure up. And maybe that's what makes him the Messiah in Mark's view. Jesus, it says in verse 4, knows what they're thinking, probably has known since forever what they thought of him. And he says to them, prophets are not without honor except in their own hometown, except in the place of their father, and among them their own kin and in their own house. Jesus acknowledges that he is without honor, but he claims a title. He claims a title for himself that says prophet. He puts himself in the line of Elijah and Moses and all of those who came before him. But then in a surprising way, 
at least surprising if we think about Jesus in the all-powerful sort of divine way. Verse 5 tells us that because of their attitude, he could do no deed of power there except that he laid uh, his hands on a few sick people and cured them. That's a curious verse for me always. He could do no deeds of power, but he did heal some people. I'm thinking if I could heal people by laying my hands on them in an effective way consistently, yeah, well, that would be enough of a deed of power for me. But it's not what Jesus has been experiencing. It's not what we've been witnessing in the story up to this point. Jesus, it says in verse 6, was amazed at their unbelief, their lack of trust, their lack of faith. It was not enough for them in order to see who he really was to hear about all of the deeds of healing and power that he'd done up to this point. Jesus is somebody who doesn't measure up for these people. And that's the way he is all the way through the Gospel of Mark. He's the one who does not measure up. He's a carpenter, not a rabbi. He's the son of Mary, a bastard child and who does he think he is coming in here and act and all pretentious? We should remember from chapter 4 the parable of the sower. Uh, remember, Jesus has already told us what the world is going to do when it responds to him. Some will receive the sower's gospel and it will fall on the path and it will be scooped up by birds and others will fall on rocky ground and well, when things get tough, then the tough will leave. And then others, like the folks here in Nazareth, the seed will go down and it will start to sprout up. And then because of the cares and the concerns of the world, well, it'll get choked out. These people can't see beyond the Jesus they think they know to encounter the Jesus who is revealed. And that, my friends, is the challenge for us 2,000 years later. Does the Jesus we think we know get in the way of the Jesus being revealed to us in this moment? So Jesus leaves. In, verse, uh, in the next verse, in the second half of verse 6, he says, it says, Then he went about among the villages teaching. He went out to the, to the rest of the countryside. And he called the twelve to them. And after this failure in his hometown... He sends them out two by two, six teams of two, and he gives them authority over the unclean spirits. He orders them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Don't even dress for it. He says to them, Whenever, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them and move along. Don't let it get to you. So they go out and they proclaim. What Jesus has in mind here, some scholars question. Is he establishing the kingdom of God? Albert Schweitzer, the great Bible scholar, later the great missionary and doctor, also a wonderful church musician, a guy of many talents, used the Gospel of Matthew to interpret what Mark was talking about because there's so little information about why these people are sent out. That's not usually a good move. Let Mark speak for himself. And maybe the fact that he's already said much about Jesus' mission is enough to inform us. Remember the parable of the sower. Jesus is now sending them out in teams of two to sow the gospel, to proclaim the good news. And it will be received by some, and when it is, they should rejoice. And when it is choked out or scooped up or dies out, don't worry about it. Move on to the next place and sow more seed. The disciples now apostles, because that's what the Greek word means, apostle, to be sent, are put into the world to be the sowers of the seed. And it's going to sometimes be received and other times not, just like it was in Nazareth. And maybe that's why Mark puts these stories together. 
Jesus wants them to see with their own eyes that he too can be rejected, he too can be ignored, that he sometimes is going to find no fertile ground for the gospel to be given a, a harvest, that even in his hometown he's not going to be accepted, so they shouldn't expect more, but when they find more, they should rejoice. Jesus comes to his own town and he doesn't measure up to their expectations. So what does he do? He moves on to the villages elsewhere and he sows the gospel where it will grow. And then he sends the disciples and now us to do the exact same thing, knowing that sometimes we'll be received and other times we won't. The, the last thing I would point out to us here is that when he gives them instructions to go from town to town, they are to stay with whoever it is that offers them hospitality, whoever welcomes them in and shares what they have. This is an essence of the mission of the church, to welcome others, to welcome strangers, to welcome people who don't measure up to the table, to cross boundaries in order to sow the gospel. And we're called to do that just as much as Jesus has been sent to do it. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, Jesus came to his own hometown and was rejected. Help us to know that sometimes the gospel will not be accepted and that we should not take this personally nor should we take it as a sign that we should silence ourselves. We should move on and continue to sow the seeds of the gospel, knowing that sometimes it will spring up and harvest 60 and 80 and 100 fold. Help us, Lord, to have the courage to proclaim and to sow in your name. Amen. Mm -hmm.